so welcome back. Um, I all hope you had a good lunch. So the main challenge now is to uh, to stay awake, I guess. Also for me. Um, anyway, um, so we will continue with the second part of uh, of the lecture. Um, I hope another 45 minutes, and then I'm finished. Um, which uh, I'll introduce a very um, different method than during the first part. The first part method was, of course, the the linear regression model bla based on classical statistics. Uh, and this second part deals with uh, a machine learning um, method, uh, random forest. Uh, I think many of you have heard about this or even worked with it. Um, so when you look at the dig digital soil mapping literature, you see, uh, I think, a shift, especially since the last couple of years. Um, so until a couple of years ago, uh, many people still use linear regression, uh, often combined to quitting for digital soil mapping. But say the last perhaps three, four, five years, you see a shift more and more towards the use of machine learning methods <coughs> for soil mapping. Um, partly because it has to do with, um, with better computer resources, uh, machine learning methods, um, they are often more demanding with respect to computer resources and these linear regression methods. Computers become better. Um, new packages, uh, new softwares are developed that implement these methods. So you now slowly see a shift. And maybe in a couple of years from now, most people will, will use machine learning uh, in digital soil mapping, um, which is not surprising. Um, machine learning methods, including random forest, have proven that they are very um, strong uh, accurate predictors. That's I think also why they become more and more popular. Um, mm -hmm. They are uh, they can uncover quite well, say, complex patterns in your in your data. That's why they call machine learning. You learn from your data using these these algorithms. Um, and I think among there are several of those, um, um, but I think random forest is among the the most popular right now. Maybe in a year from now it will be different. Who knows? Um, so that's what we will do uh, for the second part. And we also practice with random forest methods during the computer exercise. Um, so random forest uh, uh, modeling is based on, on tree models. Um, so let's first start with a tree and then go from a tree to a forest. Because if you understand how a tree works, you also understand how a forest of tree works. Um, an acronym that you often see in literature is CART for these three methods. Um, so CART is an acronym for classification and regression trees. Um, same methodology, but then classification trees are used in the context of modeling categorical data, soil classes, for instance, while regression trees are used in the context of modeling continuous data, so property data such as carbon or pH. Um, one other reason, besides their uh, strong uh, predictive capabilities, is uh, why they become more and more popular, is that they overcome some of the, uh, say, lim limitations of, of, say, classical linear models. Um, for instance, they, are, uh, they can model nonlinear relationships. Uh, I explained this morning that in linear modeling, of course, we assume a linear relationship between the, the property that we want to model and the covariates. Um, but often in reality, these relationships are, are non-linear and then we have to do some transformations. Or um, Some machine learning algorithms, including classification trees and random forest, are, are capable to model these non-linear relationships. You do not need this linearity assumption anymore. Um, they can handle situations where you have a large number of covariates. Uh, uh, Tom explained this morning that nowadays with all these satellite imagery that is there, digital elevation models, it's easy to end up with hundreds of covariates. And often you have more covariates than you have data points. Um, <coughs> and a linear regression for each, um, um, say, covariate you need between five and 10 data points in order to properly calibrate your model. So when you have only, say, 100 data points, you cannot put 200 covariates in your model. Um, and with random forest, modeling or with these three models, you do not have this limitation. Um, 
you can more easily take interactions between categorical covariates and into account. That results in sparse cell counts I wrote down here, which is a bit cryptic. But suppose you want to model an interaction, or you know there's an interaction between, for example, your soil class and your, and your land cover, when you want to model soil organic carbon. When you want to include interactions, suppose you have five soil classes and five land cover classes. You have 25, 5 times 5 combinations of those. And when you want to do linear regression modeling, you need an observation for each of these 25 combinations to be able to fit your model, um, which can be hard, especially when you have a limited sample data set. Um, <coughs> but also with, with three models, you can better, uh, say, uh, model these, these interactions. Non-parametric, which means we do not make any assumptions about the error distribution. Linear modeling, we had this uh, normality assumption. We do not need that here. And we can more easily handle some missing values in your, in your data. Um, tree modeling is based on what we call recursive partitioning of data, based on binary splitting using covariates. Um, so tree models are data splitters. And I will explain that a bit more in my, in my next slide. Um, so basically what happens when you grow a tree is you start out with the top, there's my stick here. You have your, say the, your complete data set. Say you have 100 soil samples taken in your area for which you measured. I'm again sticking with this carbon example that I also used earlier. <coughs> <coughs> so 100 samples where you measured uh, carbon. And now we want to, uh, to model your carbon concentration uh, using a set of covariates. Um, so what a tree model does, it's going to split your data set in two. And it does that repetitively. So it's going to select a covariate, say elevation. And it's going to, to look for a cutoff value, say 1,000 meters. So all samples that have are located uh, at an elevation less than 1,000 meters go this way down the tree. And the others that are located above 1,000 meters go that way. I've, I mean, I can imagine that, that on high elevation areas, I have larger carbon concentrations than the low elevation areas. So if I will make a split based on elevation, then it will reduce the variation that I have in my data. Here I have all my data points together. I have low carbon values, I have high carbon values together. So I have rel relative large variance there. When I split my data in two, then these two sets are more homogeneous than my full data set, right? And going back to this elevation example, low elevation observations go here, so I will have, say, relatively the low values. It's all hypothetically, right? Have relatively the low values here and the high values there. So these sets are more pure, more homogeneous than, than this set. <coughs> and then the algorithm, of course, we offer a set of, of covariates, 10 or 20 or 100. And the algorithm is going to pick the covariates for each split. It's going to repeat it here. Uh, here I'm at the low elevation areas. Maybe I can make a distinction between land cover. Maybe my points located on arable land go here. My, my points lo located on grassland go there, assuming that on an arable land my carbon concentration is a bit lower than, 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 than on grassland. But the algorithm, for each split, the algorithm selects the covariate that results in the largest reduction of variation in your, in your data. So it's selecting the covariate and also looking for the splitting point. So the, the, the algorithm selects the most optimal covariate and the most optimal splitting point to split your data in two in such a way that it that it maximizes the reduction in variation. And it uses some, some error measure, like the sum of squared errors or the mean squared error. So it has some criterion. Uh, you wanted to ask that? Yes, so I wanted to know, I think it uses uh, a squared error statistic or a mean squared error. I don't think so, not that I'm aware of. The algorithm handles, handles this. Yeah. 
So the splitting continues until a stopping criteria is, is met. Um, <coughs> and it's going to split your data using what we call a, a greedy algorithm, which means that it's, it's, it's looking for the most opti optimal split independent of other splits. So one, once, say, observations have arrived here, it's going to look for the most optimal split here based on this data that is not looking back anymore. Uh, because if you have, perhaps when you make this split, you could have done a better split over there, but then you would can get so many types of, of that it's almost impossible for the algorithm to, to, to come to, uh, uh, to, to convert you to, to fit your tree. So it's doing the splits independent of, of each other. And then and at one point the tree stops, then you end up with your leaves. Um, and each leaf has some observations, can be two, can be 10, depends. And then you can make a prediction for each leaf. And when you model uh, a continuous soil property like carbon or pH, your prediction for this covariate combination will be the average of the observations that you have there. <coughs> if you use, uh, uh, if you build a, a classification tree, so if you model like categorical, uh, variable like soil class, then your prediction will be the modal class, the most frequently occurring class there. Um, so when you want to make a prediction for a new location, when you want to apply this model to map, you go to a new location, you pick the covariate values there, and you throw that location to the tree. Okay, do I have this prediction location? Does it have an elevation less than 1,000 meter? This prediction location goes here to the left. If it's arable land, again, it goes to the left. And then it kind of continues down the tree based on the covariate values until it reaches a leaf. And then the, the prediction for that location is, is, is made based on, on, the, on, the, on the predictor value here, which is derived by averaging the observations that have a similar uh, covariate, uh, have similar covariate values. Um, Growing a tree in R, um, there are several packages that you can use for it. You have the R part package, the tree package, the party packages. They can all be used for this tree modeling. Um, so this is an example with the, the R part package. The, you have to give your, your trend. This is a function, my carbon is a function of elevation, land cover, etc. cetera. Um, you have to specify the object that holds your data, the method, um, there you have to specify if you're modeling categorical or continuous data. I'm modeling continuous data here, so then I have to specify ANOVA. Otherwise, I have to specify class if I want to model categorical data. And then you have some parameters that control the, uh, the, 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 the tree calibration or the tree modeling. Um, you have the, <coughs> the, the min split parameter. Um, which means you have a, you need to have at least 20 observations in in a node. So this is a node. 20 observations in a node to be able to split it. Um, there are default values, of course, but these are the settings that I used back then. This example, the minimum number of observations that you want to have in a terminal node in a leaf. So here, say I want to have a minimum of 10 observations left to be able to compute uh, the 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 predicted the predicted value. Uh, I will not go into detail for this parameter. This parameter controls the, the size of the tree because trees can go very large. It can grow very large. You can easily overfit with a tree. Uh, over the, so then your tree almost perfectly predicts your, your data, but then overfitted models are often poor predictors for, for new data points. So you have to kind of control your tree that it doesn't grow too much. At one point you have to, this is the pruning parameter, so at one point you have to kind of prune your tree. You say until here, and then you stop growing. Um, <coughs> and there is some cross-validation parameter in here. So there are, there are default values, but you can also specify them. I will not go into too much detail here now, but I'll be happy to explain later on if you, if you like, of course. So when I apply this, this model, uh, then I'm, I'm, I'm this is then my, my output. And now you see here also the covariance. So I'm modeling organic matter here. This is an example from, uh, from Rwanda, Africa. Uh, this is a, a soil class. So basically the first split is based on soil classes. So soil classes 
in, in the, for this case study, soil class is a very strong predictor of soil organic matter, perhaps not surprisingly. So if I have these soil classes, my observation goes there, and if I have other soil classes, my observation goes there. Same with landforms. Here I see a continuous covariate. This is uh, uh, a temperature covariate. So if my, my, my um, land surface temperature is above 11 degrees for that location, my observation goes there. If it's below, it goes there. And so on. And then here you see the values that I use for prediction. So if I go to a, a prediction location in my study area, and my soil class is, for example, A, and my landform is A. I'm not sure what A exactly is now. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a combi soil located on a, on a medium gradient hill. Um, <coughs> it goes here. I'm not exactly sure about this um, variable anymore. Um, but suppose your, your observation ends up here, then my prediction will be 3.4% organic matter. So each prediction location you kind of drop through the tree, it finds its path, it ends up in a leaf, and then are the values that you use to predict for that location. All right, some limitations of CART. Um, some authors um, have shown that um, trees can be unstable. And meaning that you uh, that, that are sensitive to small changes in your data. So it can happen that you make a small change in your data set and you end up at a completely different tree, uh, which is not very, very nice to have. Um, like I said, and there is a danger of, of, of overfitting, right? You do not do your pruning uh, well, then you have chance that you that you overfit your, your data. Um, okay. <coughs> so these limitations um, can be avoided using ensemble methods. And ensemble methods, instead of using one tree to make your predictions, you use a whole set of trees, a forest of trees, for instance. Um, and these ensemble methods use, that, use the fact that one tree can be a bit, bit, bit unstable, but on average, when you have many trees fitted to your data, on av and you average the results, you are, you know, quite right with that. So a random forest is such an uh, uh, ensemble method. Um, so instead of one tree, you grow a forest of trees, 500, which is the deal of an hour, or even 1,000 or 2,000. So you grow a large number of trees. Each tree, you can make a prediction, and in the end, you average predictions to get your final prediction. So you aggregate the predictions of the individual trees. So how does it work? Um, so what random forest combines the two concepts. The one, the first is bootstrap aggregation with random selection of predictors. So those are the two main features of random forest modeling. So what does these me. First, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping means splitting your sample repeatedly. So for each tree, the random force algorithm randomly selects two-thirds of your data points. So if I have 100 points in my sample data set, 66, approximately 63, are um, randomly selected from them. And based on these 63 points, your model your tree model is calibrated. Then for the next tree, again, two-thirds, approximately two-thirds of your sample points are randomly selected, which is, which and you then you end up with a different subset than for your first tree. And then to this subset, again, a tree is grown. And you repeat that for the number of trees that you have. So 500, 1,000, 2,000 times. And then to each of these bootstrap samples, you grow a tree, and you do not prune it. You just let it grow as big as it can get. And then the, the, second, the second thing. Um, so what Random Forest is also doing is that for each split, it's not going to evaluate all the covariates to pick the optimal one, but it's, it's, it's randomly picking a subset from your covariates. And the default is, I think, in R1 third. 
So if you have 100 covariates, it randomly selects 33, and it's only going to evaluate those 33 for the split. So it chooses the optimal one based on the 33 that it selects, and the other two-thirds, it doesn't look at those. Now for the next split, ag again it selects, selects one-third, but a different subset. So not one subset of covariates for the entire tree, but for each split in each tree, it selects a random subset of covariates again and again and again. And then from this selected subset, it chooses, it searches for the, the, the optimal covariate that reduces in the largest reduction of variation for a split. So, and, and then when I have grown a large number of trees, 500, 1,000, I don't know. Um, then you can uh, make a prediction. So you predict for each tree individually. You end up with 500 or 1,000 predictions. And then you, you average those when you're modeling continuous, uh, a continuous whole parameter. Or you take a majority vote, so the most frequently occurring class when you um, want to model a map, a categorical soil parameter, like soil class. So this is the idea behind random forest model. This is how the algorithm works. Um, a nice thing about random forest is that it, that it comes with an kind of internal accuracy assessment. So it's not strictly necessary to do an additional, say, cross-validation or validation of your, of your model um, to, to estimate the, the, the prediction accuracy. It's, it's doing it while it's, it's, it's fitting the model. So remember that the algorithm sets apart, or it selects only for each tree that it grows, it only selects two-thirds of your sample data. So one-third it doesn't touch. So what you can do, of course, is when you've grown a tree, you can use that tree to predict on the one-third of your data points that you did not use. And then you compare your what you predict with what you observe. And then you can compute an error. And from that error, you can compute some validation statistics like the root mean squared error or the mean squared error or the mean error. And the, the data that is not used to grow a tree, so the one-third of your points that is set aside, is often referred to as the out-of-bag data. You come across that term often when you dive into the random forest literature. So this is just what I, what I explained. This is the out-of-bag data we can use for, for validation, uh, which means that um, each location in your, uh, in your of each, each sample that you have in your data set will be out-of-bag approximately a little bit more than one-third, around 36% of the times. So if you grow 1,000 trees, then for 360 trees, each sample is not, not used. So you, you will get an out-of-bag prediction 360 times approximately for each sample. So you have, you, you have 360 errors, and then you can average those to obtain a kind of average error for, your, for each sampling site. And from that, you compute your validation statistics. Yes? Yeah. You randomly select two-thirds of the data set for cringe. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so, because I don't think it's necessary. This is, this is your, your cross-validation. Why would you do internal cross-validation? It just grow, grows a tree as large as it can get. And when you compare your, your then it's not necessary to do a cross-validation in there, then because then when you do a cross-validation, you're again going to split the two-thirds yeah. into... Uh, that's my, that's my yeah. question, yeah. when you set up This is the, this is done automatically by the by the algorithm. This is all done done automatically. Um, and implementation R. Again, you can use different packages: the random forest package, but also the party package and the sea forest package. 
Tom also implemented this in the GSAF uh, package. Um, so you load the library. We also do this in the tutorial. You specify um, uh, or you create an object where you store the, the variable, the sole parameter that you want to model. In this case, we're getting matter. You create an object where you store your covariates at your sample locations. And then you, you uh, fit a function. Um, you specify the covariate object. You specify the, 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 soil, the, the soil data object, in this case, uh, organic matter. Um, then there are some parameters that control your random forest modeling. Um, these all have default settings, so you don't need to specify them. To, to, to fit, a, say, a default random forest model in R, you only have to sp specify these first two lines. Um, and try is a parameter uh, that specifies how many covariates are randomly selected from your set for splitting. Here is at 15. By default, it's, it's, it's one third. <coughs> and three, the number of trees. I'm, s I'm generating a force here with 1,000 trees. Node size, the minimum size of the, of the terminal node. So how many observations do you want to have left in the leaves of the trees? Importance is true. This is a nice uh, um, argument to set to true because it, with, with this, um, this allows you to assess the importance of the prediction. So which predictor, which covariate is, is the most cov important covariate for your modeling or explains most of the variation in your data. You can save the whole forest in your output, all your trees. Uh, and you can also keep track of when a sample was in bag and when it was out of bag. So you can, you can kind of keep track of the whole, say, modeling. This is also all explained, of course, in the help file that is associated uh, to the function that is included in the package. Um, now then you get a whole, when you fit the tree, you get a, you get a lot of output. Um, most important, I will not discuss them all now. Um, the most important one is here, predicted. These are the predicted values at your data points. So here I use a data set again from Rwanda with 999 observations. So for each observation, I get a predicted value. And these are based on the out of back predictions. Um, so validation statistics are in there. Um, you can see the entry and and try setting. Here, my whole forest is stored. Um, <coughs> here are the, the, the Y is also an important one. These are the observed values. So I have predicted, I have observed, I can compute a residual, or I can compute some validation statistics. And here in back, this keeps track of when each observation was in back of our back, when it was used to fit a tree or when it wasn't used to fit a tree. Um, like I said, we have a predicted value. We have an observation, so we can compute a residual. Yeah, I will, co I will come to you. Uh, compute a residual by subtracting the observed from the predicted value or the other way around. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we could do, we could check if there is spatial correlation in residuals, right? And if there is, we can apply also a critic step. Then we do kind of regression critique, but then with a random forest model instead of a linear regression model. We can do that. Um, also, critique assumes normally distributed data, so we should still, or normally distributed residuals. So we should still do some checking if your residuals are normally distributed, have constant variance. Um, and then you can, can continue, you can fit your variogram, create your residuals, and add the creature residuals to your random force predictions to get your regression increasing predictions based on a random force model. Okay, question. Um, I, I think I will come back to that in, uh, in this slide. Um, so I hope I'll answer your question with this, with this slide. Um, basically, I, s I store, I can store the trees, so it's possible to access a tree in your forest. But then the question is, um, what does an individual tree, one tree in your forest, tell t really tell you? Not that much. Uh, I mean, 
we have 1,000 trees and one is not more important than the other. And you can also not really average the trees. Eh? You cannot, there is no average tree that you can, can kind of construct from your, from your forest. So they are not so easy to interpret. Linear regression is easy. You get a nice overview of your coefficients. You can take a look at that. It's easy to interpret the model. You can see what is going on. Random forest is, is a bit less easy. So with respect to that, it's a little bit of a, of a, of a maybe of a black box. Um, but what you can do, so of course you can look at a tree, but the question is, does it tell you much? Yes. Because I was trying to check in the seed forest, yeah. the, the trees which are behind, but I, I could never check it. So I have never tried uh, to find a solution to, okay. to visualize that. I'm not sure if, if, if we can do it with a random forest pack. The trees are stored, so you might be able to access them, but they can also be very big. So. Uh, Yeah. And uh, there is a way to check. Okay. They say, but uh, I have, you have no. A no, I'm not. I'm not so familiar with the C forest package, so I can I cannot give you an answer to to that. I mainly use this random forest package. Um, but what we can do uh, with random forest, uh, we can assess the importance of the of the covariates. So we can see which, is, which are the most important covariates in your model, which covariates explain most of the variation in your data. Um, and we can do that with a so-called variable importance plot. Uh, so how does that work? Um, so this plot shows um, how much the prediction error increases when the values of one predictor are uh, permuted while the others are left unchanged. So what, you, what, it, what it basically does, it, it, it picks a covariate. It kind of randomly reshuffles the covariate values over the observations. So it kind of breaks your relation, it breaks the association between your soil parameter that you want to model or any other parameter and your covariate. There's no relation there anymore. And then it puts this kind of reshuffled covariate back into the model. And then it checks if your model accuracy is affected. If it's a very important covariate, your accuracy will go down. If the covariate was not so important, then the effect on your model accuracy is very small. Then it doesn't really matter if there is no association between a covariate and your property of interest. Then it's not a problem when you randomly reshuffle the values because there was no association to start with. But this, if there is a very strong relation between the covariate and your property of interest, and when you reshuffle your covariate values randomly, then, that, then your accuracy will decrease. And you can do that for each covariate, and then you can check which covariate has the largest effect on my accuracy. And then you will get a plot like this. So here are all the covariates that you, that you use in the modeling, and here this, this is a decrease in, in, in accuracy. And this is a, the percent of decrease in the mean squared error. This is, again, my soil class covariate. And this covariate, when I random re randomly reshuffle the covariate values over the observations, it will result in a large decrease of, of my prediction accuracy. And then they're ordered in, 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 uh, in order of, of importance. So these are the most Im more important uh, covariates, and these are the less important covariates. Here I see a lithology covariate. Here I see some soil moisture-related covariates. And on top I have a, a soil. I have a precipitation, landform, another lithology map, um, digital elevation. So in this way, I can still assess which covariates are, say, the most important or most powerful covariates for predicting my soil property of interest. Um, of course, every method has its advantages and disadvantages. So be aware when you apply a random forest uh, uh, model. Um, there is no, like I just explained, no clear interpretation of, of the model. You can assess a variable importance, but you, you could look at individual trees, but they don't tell you uh, that much. Um, prediction uncertainty is not uh, easy to quantify. With linear regression, we saw it before. It's pretty straightforward, easy to implement. It doesn't use much computation resources. With random forest, it's, uh, there's a package, I think it's called Quantrec Forest by Nicholas Meinhausen, which can do that. But it's, uh, it's computationally very intense. 
And when you want to model it for a large grid, then you need a lot of resources to do it. Um, spatial correlation cannot be accounted for in the model. There is no such thing as, as far as I'm aware of, as uh, like we have preaching with external drift, that you include the spatial correlation when you're estimating your, your regression coefficients. Um, with random forest, that's not yet possible. So you really have to do your random forest trend modeling and your creaching separate from each other. Some authors warn that there can be some bias in variable selection, that some covariates are preferred over others. Uh, and the stability of the forest, you also warn that the stability of the forest can depend on your number of trees and the number of covariates that you use for splitting. So it might be worthwhile to try out uh, to try out some different settings and see if at one point your predictions stabilize. Um, so resources, so now I will finalize. Um, I included some, some literature with the course materials. Um, among the literature, there's a paper written by uh, uh, some people from uh, university, uh, Caroline Streubel. And this is, at least for me, so far, the, I think the best paper that I found that explains regression, uh, tree modeling and random forest modeling. So if you're new to this, then I think this is a very good resource to start. It's not a technical paper, so it's included in, your, uh, in, 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 in the files that you have. Um, I like it a lot. For me, it was really like a good clarifying paper. So a good paper to start with. And then there's there, there is this book, um, I think I like the, the book as well. It's a book about uh, the elements of statistical learning, uh, about all sorts of data mining, machine learning, prediction methods. Also a worthwhile resource to have when you dive a bit deeper in these uh, statistical modeling uh, topics. And then, of course, Tom Hengel, uh, he also has an... Um, has made a presentation and a tutorial about machine learning algorithms, a bit more technical than what I just presented. Um, so there's a link included here in the lecture. You can take a look at that as well. So, so far my talking. Um, so the rest of the afternoon, uh, when there are no more further questions, we will spend the rest of the afternoon on a, uh, doing some, um, some exercises with R. Uh, so I prepared a tutorial, I'll, I'll explain you in a minute about the setup, and you will see that it deals with almost everything that we, that I discussed in, in this lecture. 